I want to present a little bit of psychological research to quantify how often people make the right choice. Now, that might seem like a moral question, what is the right choice? But I'll break it down and, and the, the, the people who did these experiments, they did, it, they did them very well. It's cut and dry. The takeaway of all of this is that people are much more evil than we would all like to believe. And of course, the most important application of that is when we look in the mirror. It's very important to, to know where we're starting as a baseline if we are serious about becoming better. So let's get started. Again, what we're looking at is, is trying to quantify just where everyone is on this. So what we're going to cover are the ASH experiments. Ash was a psychologist and he was doing these experiments back in the 50s. I don't recall off the top of my head how long these went on for, but this is the basic setup of the experiment and it's repeatable. This has been repeated many times with other groups and the, the results are equivalent. So the, the patterns here are describing human nature they're not just about the 50 people that were tested under the experimental conditions or the 37 who were the control group. So how did they quantify what the right choice was? The experiment consisted of very simple questions. So for example, a set of lines where one line was clearly longer than the other lines. No tricks, very simple. And the people were asked which line was the longest among three options or something, right? One line's really long, the, other, the others are very short. Which line is the longest? And with that kind of question, the participants were, were polled to see if they were right or not. Now, the control group in 35 of the 37 cases, people got the answer correctly correct uh, across 12 questions. So they got 12 of these questions and 35 people got them all right. One person got one wrong and one person got two wrong out of 12. Okay, so they're very easy questions and to quantify just human error, honest mistake, getting the question wrong, two people got anything incorrect out of 37. So hopefully that gets the point across. It was a very simple task. Now, what was the actual experiment? Well, then they took a set of 50 people and what they did, the, there, were, there were 50 trials here and, and you'll understand why in a second. The setup was that they they'd take a group of people that were actors, paid actors, and the actors were told to state the wrong answer on this, on this question. And they were put into a group and the administrator would ask all uh, each of the actors what the answer was before they got to the test participant who didn't know that everyone else was an actor and being paid to, to tell the wrong answer. And by the time they got around to the, the participant, the participant would have heard every single answer and been primed to repeat the wrong answer under social pressure, even though they knew it was wrong, given the control group, they knew that it was the wrong answer. And so the experiment measured how often normal people are willing to lie due to peer pressure. Now, peeling this apart a little bit, this was sort of the lightest kind of peer pressure that could be. No one was gonna make fun of them. They certainly wouldn't lose their job. They didn't know these people. There was no danger whatsoever of any kind of character or reputation damage. It was merely whether they were publicly willing to oppose people they had never met before in a situation that didn't matter at all. 
the lightest possible test of human morality. And how did they do? Oh, and incidentally, on the easiest kind of question you could ever get. So there was no, there was no factor of complexity or difficulty in the actual task. They, they weren't asked to do differential equations or something, right? <clears throat> so how did they do? 38% of people made the wrong choice more than 50% of the time. So under the slightest amount of peer pressure, under the, the tiniest possible negative pressure, tension, 38% of people buckled more than half the time. So I want you to think about all of the many situations across life. Look out on the plane of life and all the different obstacles you might face here in a lifetime and all of the different ways that you rely on other people out of choice and also a lot of times without a choice. And now understand that 38% of the people that you interact with will fail abysmally under the lightest load more than half the time. This is like running a marathon where everyone has a knife and 38% of people are going to stab you more than half of the times you, you run past them. Now, this is going to see, seem like hyperbole or this sort of cat catastrophism that people like to, to accuse me of. But if you think carefully through your life experience so far, this pattern is absolutely going to fit. Because the exceptions to the rule only exist because the peer pressure was pointing in the right direction. This is, this is a terrible realization. This, this presentation is short, slide-wise, but it's, it's bitter. The people that you think of as good Odds are they're not good. Odds are they've just been placed in a situation where the conditions have caused them to act as if they were good. But all the wrong reasons are still the motivating factors for that behavior. And we're going to keep picking apart these numbers for the duration of this presentation and then get to some applications of those ideas. But it's bad, okay? It's really bad. So, let's start at the top. Let's start at the people who, out of 12 trials, only gave the wrong answer once, or never. Let's start with the, the never people. Maybe, maybe we'll come back to those folks in a minute. So when you look at these numbers, 13 people out of 50 refused to give the wrong answer. They passed the test. 13 out of 50. Now, that's 26%. And you might think, well, 26%, that's pretty good. I think it's pathetic, but maybe you think it's pretty good. Okay, that's one in four. So if you take a random sample of the population, one in four are not willing to lie when basically 
it doesn't matter. There's no negative consequence for telling the truth other than you have to disagree with someone publicly. Not argue, just state that you do not agree. How much does that number crumble when there's any pressure whatsoever beyond just the need to disagree with someone? What happens when it's going to cost you a friend? What happens when the person you're disagreeing with is going to hurt you in some way, or even just make your life a little more difficult? So we could escalate the consequence. And if we graphed this out, if we if we conducted the experiments, of course, you would see a quick drop off from about one in four down to who knows what the number would shrink so quickly relative to the cost of telling the truth. How many people are willing to tell the truth, even if it costs them their lives? Now, when we expand the number to include people who are willing to say what they know is wrong once out of 12 trials, we pick up another four people out of the 50, another 8%. So now we've got a larger number. And the question is, in our system where we load so much responsibility, when we, when we enable people to have so much power, just a few people wielding immense amounts of power in government, in religious situations, churches and whatnot. And even at work, and especially in families. Now that's a, a question of who you marry, right? Even with the plussed up number from adding people who are willing to do what they know is wrong once out of 12 times, you're still dealing with far less than 50% of the population. And the problem is that there are more positions of power than there are people worthy of them. That's what these numbers tell us. Frankly, again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but it's just so important to understand this is under the lightest conditions imaginable. If you have the launch codes for the nukes, you're not under the lightest conditions possible. If you're a father just paying the bills, totally normal family life, you are not under the lightest conditions possible, right? That's not counting when you unexpectedly lose your job or your kid gets leukemia or whatever, that these things happen. Everybody's got a tragedy, at least one. So, again, there aren't enough good people to fill the slots where good people are needed. And this is... Uh, I, I don't want to get too off too far off the beaten path with this, but this is absolutely coupled to the idea of how complex our lives have become with technology and cheap energy. We have built a system that we cannot populate effectively. Do you understand? The system has controls on it that need to be manned by people with certain attributes. And sufficient numbers of those people don't exist. And so when you get a doofus at the helm of the ship, the ship crashes. There's no other alternative. And in, in this case, it's not just a question of intelligence. In fact, 
That was stripped out of the experiment. That makes the situation even worse. But just in the most basic moral sense, there aren't enough people to run the controls where they're needed. You, you can't have someone who has to make hard decisions. Sorry, you can't have a job where you have to make hard decisions or responsibility when there aren't people willing to, to just merely state something that they know is right, undeniably, in the face of other people who disagree with them. Now, this has probably the most obvious implications in terms of government. You see, and how much of this I want to get into, let's go to this slide and then we'll come back. There's this really interesting pair of verses in DNC 98, and it says the following. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn, wherefore honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. It used to be the case that as a culture, we understood that representative government was ideal, that we should seek out people who are better than we are and put them in charge. This has become something you're not allowed to say, that you'll be ridiculed for openly acknowledging. We've set up this idol of quote-unquote pure democracy, direct elections. And in those elections, what people look for are the folks who are going to give them what they want. Instead of looking for people that are better, we're lucky if they even manage to look for people that are the same. In many ways, they look for people who are worse because they're looking for folks who are going to promise them whatever they want, even if it's terrible. When you think of a good parent today, most people would define a good parent as someone who gives their kids what they want. That's how most parents operate today. But a good parent is someone who gives their child what's good for them. And very often that's different than what they want. We've redefined even the word love is to give someone what they want. No. Or empathy, right, is to, is to feel bad for someone and give them what they want. Love is to benefit another. It's not to give them what they want. And completely coupled to this is the necessity of knowing what benefits. And there are many situations where one person will have a more accurate idea of that than the other. What we have in society is this great pantomime of pretending that we are all equal. And we have a whole lot of ideas like this that are obviously false. You're slapped in the face with it every day, but we play this, this pantomime of pretending that it's not that way. Do you know how Steve Jobs made as much money as he did and changed the world with the technology he developed? He believed things like the customer doesn't know what the customer wants. We have to design what they do not have the capability of imagining even and put it in their hands and then they'll see that it's good. But that's extremely repulsive to say to normal people. Because they want to believe that they, they can not only imagine what's good, but that they can do it all themselves. They're like the little toddlers that, that live in a world constructed by people much better than them, functionally. But they want to pretend like they're equal partners to all of it. And really, they're just playing with the, the big plastic kitchen set with the fake peas and the little plastic pots. That's how most people live their lives. They're walking around with a marvel of technology in their hand 
that they couldn't even describe how the thing works, but they pretend they deserve it. They live like kings and queens without any of the principles of good kings or queens, any of the utility. So that's a big problem. All right, now let's go down the line here. We've talked about the exceptional people, the exceptionally honest people who just, they're going to tell it how it is and they don't really care if there's peer pressure against them. Okay, now what about the rest? As we migrate down towards the, the halfway mark of how frequently they got it wrong, how frequently they lied, essentially, under peer pressure. As we march closer to that threshold, we, we start to see this group who, if you look at the COVID fiasco, these are the people who fall for the slogans. These are the people who are persuaded by the most insufficient arguments. Basically, they're people who are, who are looking for some excuse to walk in the default human behavior. So the default human behavior is, I don't want to resist other people. I want to go with the crowd. I want my life to be easy, and I don't want to have to think about things or march to the beat of a different drum. But I'm smart enough to know that the answer is wrong and feel bad about it if I lie. So I need some excuse. So someone whips up a slogan and all of a sudden, hey, I'm on board. Now I've got, oh, you, we have to save grandma. It's safe and effective. I'm on board. Right? Stop the spread. Two weeks to stop the spread. I'm on board. Right? That is a huge chunk of the population. So if you start looking at five or six mistakes out of 12, you're somewhere around the halfway point. And you're talking about a huge chunk of people. There's a third group in my little arbitrary separation here. And these are the people who got it wrong 10 or 11 times. Now, there's a lot of bad news in this topic. So there is one piece of good news. Zero people got it wrong every time. But I'm actually going to spin this and tell you why that's actually bad news too. <laughs> the fact that zero people got it wrong 12 times means they really knew how bad it was that they were lying. They wanted to save one time. Every one of these people wanted to save one time so that in their heads, they didn't lie every single time. Do you understand that? And for, for most people, so as you go down the line from 12, 11, 10, and so on, the numbers increase. So basically what this tells you is that it helps you to quantify how many times someone has to tell the truth to feel like a halfway decent person to not feel like utter garbage. This is so telling of human nature. Because when people talk about being good or evil, they're not talking about the extremes. They like to live in a place somewhere in the middle. And they will go out of their way to do overtly good things a couple of times so that they're not on the extreme of evil. And then they think they're good. That's how people are. So again, just using COVID as an example, why do you think people rushed to get the shot? It wasn't because they believed it was going to work. Now this is a multifactorial situation. But things like this get tons of traffic because when you make something a moral situation and you give an easy solution, 
It's like throwing chum into the water and the sharks show up. Surprise. Why? Because you're telling terrible people that they can make this, this um, penance for their sins. You know, all you have to do is give your money to the church. Indulgences, right? Give your money to the church and then you can sin, but you're not going to be evil anymore because you're doing or this overt act of charity. This, Jesus said, don't do your alms before men. Why? Because you'll prance up to the offering box and dump in your gold. That's like maybe 1% of your income and because you're rich and then you'll go off and do horrible things and feel justified. And you'll be wrong. This happens again and again and again. That's why virtue signaling is such a big deal. These arbitrary shibboleths that people choose, and it's not just one side of the political spectrum who does this. It's absolutely everyone. It's a human problem that everyone's susceptible to and that many people fall for. They want to give their offering and then be good. Knowing that they're evil, they just they want to stay off of that extreme because they think as long as they do good in a couple of ways, they can keep doing evil in many other ways. Any, any named religion has something like this. Every single one does. It, it's it's got to be somewhere in the IRS code for churches or something because you'll find it in every single one where they have something that they do that they say makes them good without actually being good. It's some right, it's some belief, some mantra that they repeat over and over again. And I could name names and go down the line, but if you have half a brain cell, you've already got it for the ones you know. So these people, these 10s, 11s, and 12s, well, there are no 12s, but the 10s and the 11s, these are the ones who drive these campaigns that the other people fall for. These are the people who orchestrate the spread of evil, the practice of evil. We were talking about these folks. These folks are the ones who engineer the systems that encourage the other people to be better than they are. These folks do the opposite. These folks are evil, even though they're not 12s. All right, let's keep rolling. Did that. All right. I actually did this vocally already, so I'm not sure I will actually walk through this slide. But it's scary to break down the percentages here. Okay. Just briefly, because we kind of already touched a little on this. One takeaway I want to highlight here that we haven't talked so much about is how easy it is to willingly do the wrong thing a lot of times and still think you're a really good person. So looking at this table, people who, who chose the right answer most of the time, that's this section here. That's 60% of the people. That's a big number. It's more than half. Those are the kinds of people who walk around smugly thinking that they're good people and who respond violently when someone who's actually good points out their sin. It says, hey, you still need to work on this. You're not as great as you think you are. And they freak out. Why? Because they think that the person criticizing them is making a mountain out of a molehill. Here's the thing. If you actually quantify the percentages here, and you can do that, this experiment allows us to quantify how often these things happen. And again, it's under the lightest load, so the real numbers are much worse than this but it gets really hard to measure, all right? The fact is that these people 
who do good, quote, most of the time, they still do what they know is wrong a heck of a lot of the time. If you depended on someone on matters of life and death, let's say that you were strapped together and they're the ones that had the parachute and you're jumping out of a plane. Would you jump out if one time in 12 they weren't going to pull the line? Maybe if you just had to jump out once. And that's basically Russian roulette. Okay? The numbers are slightly better. <laughs> Because instead of a six shooter, it's a twelve shooter. But there's one bullet in the in the in the drum, and you get twelve options, twelve chances, right? Are you gonna jump out of that plane? Are you gonna pull the trigger? Most people would say that they're not going to do that. But how many people get married? How many people take a job? So are you telling me that those things are actually not all that serious? How many people join a church and now they have some church leader who's pulling the rope, who, pulling the, 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 the parachute, right? So either you have to play Russian roulette and put this thing that could end you against your temple and pull the trigger, knowing that one out of 12 of these things is loaded, or you have to water down that experience so much that it doesn't matter if they're a terrible person. So what's the difference between a marriage where you actually have to fully rely on the other person, you're fully invested in them, you're completely open with them, you actually have the deepest intimacy, and a marriage where you're playing it safe because one out of the 12 chambers has a bullet in it. They're worlds apart. And guess which one is more common in the world today? I challenge you to find the first type at all. What about a church? We could go through that. What's the difference between thinking your church leader is just some dude who spends a little bit more time in the scriptures than you do, or has a certificate or something, or wears funny clothes, and thinking this person is more like Jesus than anyone I know. There's a really big difference between those two things. And again, I reverse the order, but I challenge you to find any church that's like that. Even one, let me know. Government. What's the difference between thinking that the person who's representing you in Congress or your, your county board or whatever is more virtuous than you and does that job better than you could to the point where if you disagree with them on something, you're going to assume they're right and you're wrong. And that might not be true, but that's where you'll start. And what we have today. It's worlds apart. And what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. We could keep going, but you get the point, right? So doing good most of the time, but not all the time, is not good enough. It's not good enough. You can't have nice things in this world without these kinds of relationships where you can really lean on somebody. If your spouse really messes up and willingly does what they know is wrong one out of 12 times or two out of 12 times, or three out of 12 times, or five or six, or whatever the number is. That will absolutely be disastrous. It will completely prevent you from having the ideal kind of marriage. And we could go again through all these other situations. And that's the 60%, the best 60% of people. Slightly less than half of people are much worse than that. Now, again, we are not talking about capacity. That's excluded from this conversation. It makes everything worse. 
because most people are really dumb on top of all of that. The fact is, if you cranked up the difficulty of these questions, these numbers would get way worse very quickly. Now, one thing that, that we can't talk about because it would make this presentation way too long, but which I have talked about before and I will spend more time on it later, is the fact that another limitation of this experiment is that these were isolated trials so each participant had to answer 12 questions in life there are many more than 12 questions and the fact is that as you traverse through life and you willingly do less than your best it actually occludes your ability to see what is best as you go forward so in other words, every time you willingly do less than your best, you actually reduce your ability to see what is best. And without going too much more into that, hopefully it's clear that most people are on a downward trajectory in life where they're just going to get worse with time. And that is, in fact, what you see. And it's terrible. So... As a result of this, I think, I hope that one, you pay more attention to the quote unquote little things where you knowingly do less than your best, where you willingly lie, where you willingly say something that you know is not true, or you say nothing when someone else does those things. Two, I also hope that you now start to understand a little more how God sees you. Because if you're the kind of person that would get one or two or three or four or five of these questions wrong, you are not right with God. Even though you can accurately say, I do the right thing most of the time. Or I try. I try to do the right thing. Well, whoopee dee do. You know, let's get you one of those paper crowns from Burger King for all your hard work. But you, you're not right with God. And it has a, an astronomical effect in your life, which we just talked a little bit about. But this is a poison that will spread through everything. It will absolutely prevent you from having the desirable version of human relationships in your life. You cannot be a reliable person to anyone in your life if you're willing to do what you know is not the best, even once, because you will fail those people. And it will be in ways that absolutely matter. And it's just not going to take very much to persuade you to do that, to totally drop the ball. So I hope that you see that this is a big deal, and I hope this gives you a little bit of insight to make serious changes in your life where they're needed.